In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, welcome uh, everybody uh, to this yani, wonderful occasion. Ahna, today we're very blessed to have with us uh, Dr. Mina Bisayed, uh, who is uh, yani, uh, dedicated his life to theology. And um, actually, Mina, yani, uh, Dr. Mina, we figured out that Nahna friends من غير منعرف, because he's Canadian like myself. And all his friends are my friends, which was very surprising. Another thing, if you remember, he was ordained epidiacon on the day uh, that I was ordained a priest. And truly, I learned from him a lot. Yeah. But we're very blessed to, to have him, and he's going to talk about a lot of topics that we all have questions about as servants. And we all see these kinds of questions asked to us. It's a very good opportunity for us to learn a little bit about the history of, of our church and, and the theology that goes into every age that the church has, has passed through and the councils and, and all this stuff. I encourage you all to pay attention and uh, I encourage you all to ask questions. There is a form, a Q&A form that was sent. If you don't have it, and it's special for this meeting, different than the Bible chat one. Uh, I, we can repost it to the servants group for you all to... Post as many questions as possible, uh, and every session will be, yani, will begin with like 10 minutes of, uh, of, of Q&A. We have four planned sessions. Uh, if you don't have the schedule, we can reshare it. And in between each, there's a, there's a break. Uh, yani, we pray, Kida, that uh, God uh, blesses Mina's, uh, Dr. Mina's service and yani, bless his efforts uh, uh, with the School of uh, with, uh, Theo Theology Academy. Uh, if y'all don't have that YouTube channel, you guys should subscribe. Uh, and I think it's in fifi English. But English will be Arabic, Yeah, yes. Uh, yani, please uh, help me in welcoming uh, Dr. Mina at the site. Good morning, everyone, and it's a huge blessing to be here. I consider myself as a member of this church, truly, uh, because I was uh, a very memorable day for me was here at Archangel Raphael. I love the congregation. I love the fathers. Otsabuna Thanasis and Otsabuna Tobia are just wonderful uh, 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 fathers to be with, the deacons, the congregation. It's, it's very, very... Uh, uh, humbling to be part of this family, this big family, and uh, I'm not really sure if you'll be able to tolerate the next four hours or so, but God willing, hopefully, uh, uh, we, we, um, we're, we're together in the presence of the Lord, and, and if there are any, anything that drops or anything that's not making sense, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, usually we'll, we'll have the Q&A at the end of the session or the beginning of the next session as Abuna instructed. But if there is uh, yani, any clarification questions, if you want me to repeat something, if I'm talking too quick, if you get lost, feel free to raise your hand and I'm more than happy to repeat myself again. Okay, so... To begin, uh, by God's grace, we, I was asked to give you a topic on the denominations, right? So we are the Coptic Orthodox Church. Which family of orthodoxy do we pertain to? There are two families, right? Two families of orthodoxy. There's the Oriental Orthodox Churches and there's the Eastern Orthodox Churches, okay? When you're reading history, sometimes when you're reading about the churches back in the time, they'll always say the Eastern churches. Especially when you're reading history books, مثلا, before the 5th century, right? 
We were all part of the Eastern churches before the 5th century. We were all considered churches in the East. Egypt, Antioch, Jerusalem, كل دولة East, right? Constantinople, كل دولة East. And then as soon as the Council of Chalcedon came, when was the Council of Chalcedon? 451, 451, okay? Very good. As soon as the Council of Chalcedon came, we split into two families. The Oriental Orthodox family, which is us, the Coptic Church, Ethiopian Church, Eritrean Church, the Malankara Indian Church, and the Armenian Orthodox Church. So the Syrian, the Malankara, the Indian, uh, the Armenian, the Ethiopian, the Eritrean, and the Coptic. Okay? And then the Eastern Orthodox Churches. The Eastern Orthodox Churches are all the Byzantine Churches. The Greek Orthodox, the Ukrainian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, uh, the Serbian Orthodox, Kulledulet, Eastern, uh, right now they're known as Eastern Orthodox. Are we following? Okay. So, so far we were one church, 451 we became two churches, and then after 500 or more years, in 1054, 1054, there was a schism, there was a controversy or a tension between the Church of Constantinople in the East and the Church of Rome in the West. This is known as the East and West Schism. Okay? The East and West Schism separated the Church of Rome from the churches of the East. Okay? So we were one Orthodox Church, then we split into Eastern and Oriental. We had nothing to do with the Church of Rome because we were in Egypt and under the Arab conquest, etc. And then the Church of the East still had affiliations with Rome. And then in 1054, they split into, you have still the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? This is 1054. And then approximately 500 years after, you have a Catholic monk. His name is Martin Luther. Martin Luther wanted to go against the corruption in the Catholic Church. Him and others known as John Calvin, uh, Anselm of Canterbury, Martin Luther, all these created or triggered what we call the Reformation. Okay? They wanted to reform the church. Not our church, we had nothing to do with them, but the church of Rome, which is the Catholic church, okay? We were one with the church of Rome, we were one with the church of Constantinople, we were one with the church of Antioch, we were one with the church of uh, Jerusalem. And then in 451, we split into Oriental and Eastern. In 1054, the Eastern split into Eastern and Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was originally the Church of Rome. And then 500 years after, you have the Reformation. Okay? Come on, we will get to it later today, how the Anglican Church started. The Anglican Church is a very different story. Okay, it's a king who wanted to give birth to children. Uh, he wanted to divorce his wife, the queen, because she wasn't able to give him children. And he wanted to get married. Taban, the Catholics say, no, divorce. Okay, so two of the advisors of the king of England told him, see back men, the pope, enter the pope. What do you mean? So they're like, it's the Anglican Church. You are both the king and the ruler of this church. 
And you can divorce and marry as many as you want and give rise to an heir. And that's how the Anglican Church started. And to this day, who is the leader of the Anglican Church? The King of England. The current King Charles III. Okay? Yes? She's still the ruler of the church. Yeah. It's a very interesting system. This is one of the problems with the Church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, I respect all churches. I am not talking about any churches. I don't mean to. But one of the problems with a church system is that when it intermixes between church and state, yani you will never hear about, for the popes of Alexandria governing the city and governing the church. That never happens. He is a spiritual leader. His residence is in the church, not in the government. Okay? The problem with many Western churches is their, their, uh, uh, their governance is in the government and in the church. Do you see what I mean? We don't have that, and many of the Eastern churches don't have that. Okay. علشان نحفظ numbers. 451 Council of Chalcedon. If I uh, add the number, the three digits, 4 plus 5 plus 1 gives me 10. And then 1054 is the East and West Schism when Roman Catholicism came into existence. 1 plus 5 plus 4 gives me 10. Okay? Those are the two numbers, two years we all need to remember. Why do we need to know this stuff? Does it bring us closer to God? I have a question for you. Why are you here in the Coptic Church? We need to be convinced that this is an authentic tradition. We need to be convinced that the fathers, the bishops, the hierarchy that we follow and that we submit to are real authentic leadership. You know what I mean? If I'm not going to ask you these questions, your young children will ask you these questions. So it's important to dive deeper into history. Okay. For the remainder of the time, I'm going to give a prelude or an introduction to the Council of Chalcedon. Sa'alashan Narf, Council of Chalcedon or Magma Khalkadunya, we have to go back 20 years from 451, subtract 20 years, that would be 431. If I go back 20 years, it's the Council of Ephesus. Okay. If you go back to the ordination of Pope Tawadros II, how many years ago was that? Pope Tawadros was ordained November 20, 2012. This year it is 10 years. Okay? Okay. When they were reading Fi Fi Haga Fatas, you may have smeha a taklid, the tradition. Okay? لما أي أب أسقف بترسم بيقولوا له حاجة اسمها التقليد فالبابا كأسقف ل للسكندرية والكهرة بيقولوا له التقليد فجيت دور على واحد من الأباء الأسقفة I can't remember who exactly but he was listing the the councils in the in the tradition in the تقليد and he was saying according to the council of Nicaea Nicaea Constantinople Ephesus the first and Ephesus the second. And it was very interesting to hear Ephesus the second in our tradition. Why Ephesus the second? What's the history behind Ephesus the second? Obviously we don't say Ephesus the second in the absolution. Why? Because it caused us problems afterwards and we'll see how. But the council of Ephesus had two phases. First phase in 431 Second phase in 449. That's Ephesus the second. Okay? And then after 449, by two years, we have the Council of Chalcedon. So we need to read the entire package together. I can't dissociate the councils from each other. What triggered the Council of Ephesus? It primarily was convened to discuss the Christological controversies between the Alexandrian 
in the Antiochian traditions. Okay, no of henna. There are two schools of thought in the early church. There's the school of Alexandria and there's the school of Antioch. Okay? Those were the two big schools of thought. Obviously there were more schools, but they weren't as popular as those two. But let me mention this. The school of Alexandria was even more important or more, uh, uh, more famous than the school of Antioch. School of Alexandria, you should be really proud of your church. Your church set the pace of theology in the world. Okay? The reason why anyone knows theology in the world was because of the school of Alexandria. It's because of us. It's because of our fathers. And I'm not saying this out of patriotism. Yani, hooray, we're the son of uh, St. Athanasius or St. Cyril. This is, this is real. This is real. Okay? Okay, so the Council of Nicaea discussed the divinity of the Son. Arius said that the Son is not divine. They're like, sorry, Arius, no, the Son is fully divine. Okay, Council of Constantinople, they said that the Holy Spirit is fully divine. Someone known as Macedonius or Macedonius, he said that the Holy Spirit is not fully divine. They're like, no, the Holy Spirit is fully divine. Okay, we rest for a little bit. And then? The school of Antioch <clears throat> had a pope known as Nestorius. Nestorius or Patriarch Nestorius of Constantinople. Okay? The school of Antioch had a very uh, literal reading to scripture. A very literal reading to scripture. So, what does that mean? For example, when they read scripture and they see that the Lord Jesus Christ was hungry. Oh, who's hungry? It's Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. We say that he is both human and divine simultaneously, right? He's fully divine and he's fully human simultaneously, right? When they read so the school of Antioch, we're talking about the school of Antioch. When they read scripture and Jesus was hungry, they're like, okay, he was hungry in humanity or divinity? In humanity. Okay. Jesus healed the blind. Did he heal him with his divinity or his humanity? His divinity. So what did they start to introduce? A division. In Christ. Christ is divine. He, he, he performs divine actions with his divinity. And sometimes he's performing human actions with his humanity. Did we accept that? No, 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 no. At the end of this lecture, I want you to memorize one single line or a quote from St. Cyril of Alexandria. One incarnate nature of God, the Word. One incarnate nature of God, the Word. One incarnate nature of God, the Word. And at the let's see when I drink this water, am I drinking with my humanity or my soul or my, my, my spirit or am I drinking the water? I am drinking the water. Everything about me is drinking the water. I can't detach my soul and spirit from my body. And similarly with Christ. If we say Christ died with his humanity on the cross, then there's no salvation. Then he's like any one of us. If you crucify him, he will die. Look, and why was his cross salvific? Because the one hung on the cross is both human and divine. Because he is human and divine, in, in the Gospel of John it says, For so God loved the world, the world, the world. Can you imagine? Yani, is Zabiha bata salib, or the sacrifice of the cross, wasn't only for the people 2,000 years ago. 
It's the exact same thing that we see on the altar. It is the exact same thing that w- was, was witnessed in the sacrifices in the Old Testament and it culminated on the cross. It is one sacrifice for the entire world. Why was it able to uh, uh, accommodate the entire world? Because the one hung on the cross is the Son of God. If I'm hung on the cross, can I save you? No. I didn't die for the world. There was only one who was able to die for the world. Because through his divinity, he was able to save all of humanity. Let's say this again. Through his divinity, he was able to save all of humanity. If, if it's a human versus human, halus. You know, one-on-one, and that's the end of the story. But it's the divine human, Christ Jesus, who died for the sake of the world. Someone like St. Cyril, when he heard Nestorius and his school differentiating the Son into one part human, one part divine, he's like, no, 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 there's a problem here. There's a big problem here. If we start to differentiate the parts of the Son as human and divine, then we are threatening our salvation. It's not real. He didn't, it, it, this, the sacrifice is not salvific. It's just a human corpse inside who died for himself, and congratulations, it had nothing to do with me. But this is the divine sacrifice. It is the divine blood of Christ that saved me, you, and everyone. And everyone who accepts. So we'll talk about later on how the Catholics, you know, Yanni, we're talking about universal salvation and everyone saved. No. The sacrifice of the cross is for the whole world, but for the world that accepts the sacrifice. You you have an action. You need to accept the sacrifice. He's there crucified for everyone, but you need to accept. Then what if I don't accept? Then no salvation. No salvation. Okay? It's both. Always remember, there's both human and divine together, working together. I can't separate between both. I can't just, you know, go to my exam tomorrow and be like, God will help me. You won't. You need to work. When you work, God will help you. If you just, you know, stay together and watch Star Wars and then go to your exam, God will look at you and be like, how can I help you? You're not helping yourself, right? It's human and divine together. So, Nestorius became Patriarch of Constantinople on April 10th, 428. How many years before the Council of Ephesus? Three years, because the Council of Ephesus is in 431. Very good. So, once upon a time he had a priest. A priest in his basilica or in his church who was preaching that St. Mary is not the Theotokos. Oh, she's not the mother of God? No, she's just the mother of a human. The school of Antioch used to always separate between human and divine. So he's like, And he called her Anthropotokos, the son of a man. Not Theotokos, the mother of God. Sorry, the mother of a man, not the mother of God. Okay? Anthropotokos is the mother of man. Theotokos is the mother of God. So Nestorius was listening to to the Waza, and Anastasius the priest was like, by the way, St. Mary is not the Theotokos. And he started criticizing the title Theotokos. And Nestorius was sitting on his chair because he was a pope, a patriarch, and he didn't respond. So, Cyril of Alexandria implored Nestorius in his second letter to maintain the title Theotokos. He's like, no, you have to maintain the title Theotokos or else you are destroying our salvation. Then that person who died on the cross is just a normal person. But no, she is 
the mother of the Son of God. Cyril also asked him to disregard the two sons' Christology of someone called Theodore of Mopsuestia. Theodore of Mopsuestia, or in Arabic, Theodore el Masisi. Okay? He was a bishop of Mopsuestia, also part of the school of Antioch. And they started to teach people that there are two sons. One, the son of man, and one called the son of God. Which is, which is not the teaching of the church. Christ Jesus is both the son of man and the son of God simultaneously. Okay? So, let's read parts of the second letter. By the way, St. Cyril has three letters to Nestorius. Okay? This is the second letter, and what does he say? We, therefore, confess how many Christs? One. One Christ and Lord. Not as worshipping a man with the word. I mean, he's telling him, don't differentiate. Nestorius, please, don't differentiate between the word and the man. No. That man called Christ Jesus is the word of God. He's, saying, he's telling him, not as worshipping a man with word lest this expression with the word su should suggest to the mind the idea of division, right? If I say, here's the word and here's the man, I'm separating. But worshiping him as one. I want you to engage. Okay? If, if I... If I fell on the note, you can do it. Okay? the choir. But worshiping him as one and the same. For as much as the body of the Word with which he sits with the Father is not separated from the Word himself. By the way, some people read this stuff and they think it's like philosophy. This is not philosophy. This is our salvation. If we don't read this text seriously, we are threatening our salvation. But look at what he's saying. If, however, we reject the personal union as impossible or unbecoming, we fall into the error of speaking of two sons. For it will be necessary to distinguish and to say that he who was properly man was honored with the appellation of son. That man called Christ Jesus is the son. And that he who is properly the word of God has by nature both the name and the reality of the sonship. He's not called the Son of God because like this is a nice title that God the Father spoke to him in baptism. No. This is the title of him because it is his property. I am the Son because I am born from the Father. Now, the beauty of this, Christ Jesus is the Son of the Father by nature. And we are the Son of the Father by adoption, grace. We stick, we stick with Christ Jesus in communion. And He is the bridge between us and the Father. If I say I am sticking only to a human, not the human God, then I have no eternal life. You see how dangerous it can come and go. Okay. We must not therefore divide the one Lord Jesus Christ into two sons. This was the sentiment of the Holy Fathers. Therefore they venture to call the Holy Virgin the Mother of God. Not as if the nature of the Word or His divinity had its beginning from the Holy Virgin. He's not saying that Theotokos like, the mother of God, it doesn't mean she created God in her womb. No. What happened is the word of God took for himself flesh from the virgin's womb. And this flesh is the entire humanity. He united himself with the entire humanity through the womb of the virgin. But because of her was born that holy body with a rational soul, to which the word being personally united is said to be born according to the flesh. 
It's just very beautiful. You have the one word of God who in the end of times, as St. Paul said, took flesh from the virgin and appeared in the form of man, encompassing all of our humanity in him. Okay. There was then tension between St. Cyril and Nestorius, and Nestorius said, no, I don't accept this. St. Cyril responded with another letter known as the Twelve Anathemas. Al-Hurumat, Al-Ithna, Ashr. Okay? Mahrum, you know, anathematized whoever does not call the version the Theotokos. Mahrum or anathematized whoever doesn't believe in the Son of God. And so on, twelve anathemas. Okay. Now, a lot of people look at the... So, this is... This is, Yanni, we're, we're now going or progressing into the Council of Ephesus. So who called for the Council of Ephesus? Emperor Theodosius II. Emperor Theodosius II. Okay. I'm going to introduce a new thing here, but please pay attention to this. Some people think that the ecumenical councils are all political. They're all political. The emperor is calling for a council. Why does he why does he even bother to care about uh, 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 theology in this case, right? It makes sense. Shouldn't this be a council of bishops? Makes sense. Thus we have to realize what's going on in the Roman Empire at that time. Can you imagine before Constantine, if you're a Christian, your end fate would be martyrdom. Like literally. Anyone coming from that back door into the church in the first, second, third century, they'd be like, <laughs> as soon as you come here, <laughs> like literally. <laughs> if you're a bishop or a priest in the church, you're dying 100%. At some point, you're going to be a martyr 100%. Okay? This is not like 50-50 uh, gents. This is 100% you're dying. The, there was a change in the empire when Constantine came on board. When Constantine came on board, he issued the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan in 313 A.D. This was before the Council of Ephesus by hundreds of years, by a hundred or, or, or more years, okay? When the Edict of Milan was issued, there was religious tolerance. I will accept a Christian, I will accept a Jew, I will accept a pagan, I will accept all these people in my empire, okay? Did Constantine or the emperors, did they have Yanni so much faith in the church, in Christ? No. Constantine was baptized when he was dying. He remained all this all his life not baptized. But he called for his bishops to come and baptize him on his deathbed. So he wasn't too religious. But there was something that frightened the empires or the emperors whenever there was a heresy or whenever there was a controversy between the patriarchs. If there's a, a controversy between the churches of the empire, there's an instability in the empire. So, من صالح الامبراطور إن هو يفضل instability دي علشان الامبراطور تعيش في سلام. So, you know, the empire, the emperor was like, you know, تعالوا please discuss it together علشان بس ال 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 empire بتاعتنا تمشي. لأن لو كل واحد حي حيشد مع التاني يعني ما فيش حاجة it's it's gonna be a calamity. It's going to be a calamity. So what happened? Emperor Theodosius calls for or summons for the Council of Ephesus the first. Which year? Four thirty-one. Four thirty-one. Always remember, Council of Ephesus the first is twenty years before the Council of Chalcedon. Bravo. Okay. So the Council began. Seven days after it was scheduled, 
since John of Antioch and his bishops did not arrive on time. Okay, so this was an issue. Now, what do we have? The Church of Alexandria, the Church of Constantinople, the Church of Rome, the Church of Antioch, some representatives from the churches of Jerusalem, and the affiliated regions. Church of Jerusalem by that time was dying. Okay, Jerusalem was destroyed, not a lot of bishops. The bishops after the Jewish bishops were Gentiles, and it was slowly dissolving. But anyhow, so now everyone is traveling to the city of Ephesus. So St. Cyril arrives on time, and Nestorius, obviously the heretic, doesn't attend. Uh, there is another bishop of, uh, of Ephesus. His name is Memnon. He arrives. Juvenal of Jerusalem. He arrives. All these arrive. Taban, the Pope of Rome, who was with us and who endorsed St. Cyril at that time, didn't go, but he sent delegates on his behalf. Two priests, I think, as we will see. Okay? مين اللي فضل عطل كده في السكة؟ John of Antioch. Okay? So St. Cyril, he convened the council and he took all the decisions and he canonized the 12 anathemas and خلاص, this is solid. Theotokos is the title that we're adhering to. The uh, Christ Jesus is the Son of God. The 12 anathemas are going to be uh, uh, yani, uh, are going to be become a canon in the church. After four days, after the convening of the council, John of Antioch. So he came and he's like, So what did John of Antioch do? He took his bishops and in a local council, Haram al Kurullus. حرموا وكل البيشوبس معاه. Okay? So طبعا, this caused an uproar in, uh, or an even more tension or instability in the council. These are all the sessions. At the end of the council, what happened is the emperor, you, uh, the emperor بقى كان زعلان. يعني ان الدنيا ما تحلتش ما بين الاباء المجتمعين. For the emperor deposed Cyril of Alexandria, Memnon of Ephesus, and Nestorius of Constantinople. He said, those three are deposed. Now, Cyril of Alexandria and Memnon of Ephesus were exempted from this decree afterwards. So, for the first St. Cyril and Memnon of Ephesus, the Imperator haram them. That's only in the beginning. And then afterwards, he lifted al-hurumat alayhum, and they were no longer deposed. Okay. Nestorius was then sent to a monastery of Eupripius, then exiled to Petra in, uh, in Arabia in 435, then exiled to the Egyptian deserts where he died in 449. Now, who is a huge advocate of St. Cyril of Alexandria in Egypt? His name is the Archmanadrite. St. Shenouda. Okay? St. Shenouda is a huge advocate of St. Cyril, and he supported him. St. Shenouda was, was very strong. So, علشان يعملوا تأديب للنستور ودو الصحراء المصرية غالبا عند الأنبا شنود رئيس المتوحدين. أقعد معاه هناك بقى إيه وأتعلم proper theology. Okay? After a few years, so this was in 431, after a few years the emperor was like, لا مش حلو كده. The bishops are still يعني uh, away from each other. St. Cyril of Alexandria and John of Antioch they're still not in communion. So, in 433, Emperor Theodosius II implored for the re-establishing of unity between the seas of Antioch and the seas of Alexandria. He's like, Cyril, please, please, try to reconcile with John of Antioch. Bordo, when people are reading this, they say, Oh, 
المجامع المسكونية دي it's, it's politics دي جاية من الامبراطور no uh, yes الامبراطور he doesn't have anything to do with theology he wouldn't really care about theology right they, I mean these people originated from pagan backgrounds like they weren't really immersed into church but again the emperor always strived to make communion between the churches for the stability of the empire okay John of Antioch, uh, this uh, we need to pay attention to because this will lead us into the Council of Ephesus II and Alatul. As soon as we say Council of Ephesus II, we're talking about the Council of Chalcedon. Okay, the, t the gap between them is two years. Cyril, uh, sorry, John of Antioch sent a profession of faith to Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril promptly sent a letter back which came to be known as the formula of Reunion. بالعربي وثيقة الاتحاد. أول لما تسمعوا الكلمة دي وثيقة الاتحاد دي ما بين مين ومين؟ القديس كيرلس في اسكندرية ويوحنا في أنتيوك. Very good. When the Antiochians observed this notable turning point, they professed the Council of Ephesus. They were very happy. إذا Cyril of Alexandria is approaching us again, this is wonderful. What did they do? They confessed the Council of Ephesus. They started to endorse and support the Council of Ephesus. John of Antioch, Antioch disparaged Anthropotokos, which Theodore of Mopsuestra introduced and adhered to Theotokos. So even John of Antioch, from the school of Antioch, is like, no, Anthropotokos di Galat, we're going to endorse Theotokos. And the formula of reunion was established. Now, if we read the formula of reunion, oh, if we read the formula of reunion, St. Cyril is trying to establish a unity between the schools of thought. One school of thought says one nature. The other school of thought says two natures. By the way, for those of you who are sitting and are like, what does this have to do with Eastern and Oriental Orthodoxy? This is the whole story. Okay, the one nature, the two nature, that, that story, this is the story. Okay, this is how the story originated. So St. Cyril, when he was writing the formula of reunion, he wanted to explain that, by the way, I as Cyril, I am not denying that Christ is a divine nature and a human nature. I'm not denying that he's divine and human. But so this divine and human natures form the one nature. They're united in a, in a way, in a mysterious sacramental way, to form the one nature of the incarnate word, God. And he's like, according to my human perception, when I think about it, yes, sometimes when I close my eyes and think, yes, I could see a human nature and a divine nature. That's only in thought alone. But in reality, they are one nature. It's not the human Jesus who died on the cross. It is Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross. And that's why in the middle of... Uh, uh, Good Friday on the sixth hour, we say the hymn of O Mono Denis, O only begotten who died on the cross. <laughs> the Word of God, this is Him on the cross. Can you imagine? Formula of reunion was understood differently by both parties, the Alexandrians and the Antiochians, which later started the divisions of the Council of Ephesus II. This misunderstanding smoothly caused the catastrophe or the split of the universal church in the Council of Chalcedon. Okay, this is the last slide for this session before we go on a break. Antiochians, like the Cilicians, did not adhere to the formula of reunion as they opposed Cyril. Okay, Theodore of, Cy of Cyrus initially opposed and then consented to the formula of reunion. Anyhow, this slide in general will 
tell you that the two parties, after reading the formula of reunion, still understood Cyril differently. And to this day, if you go to the Eastern Orthodox Church, they're going to tell you Cyril of Alexandria saying two natures. If you go to the Oriental Orthodox Church today, we're going to say, no, Cyril said one incarnate nature of the Word of God. Why are they saying here two, and why are they saying one? Because in the formula of reunion, St. Cyril says, yes, I can, I can distinguish partially you know, the human attributes versus the divine attributes, but in thought alone. Just in my imagination as a human. That's how I can feel and how I can understand. But in reality, it is the one incarnate nature of Christ. Now, because of the misunderstanding between the Antiochians and the Alexandrians, we start a new controversy. How many years after? 18 years after. Okay? So, the Council of Ephesus is in 431. Add 18 years... 449, that's the Council of Ephesus II. And you have someone known as Iftichus, or, in the Arabic, Yutikis, or Utahi, who starts to read the, the, the writings of St. Cyril, and he starts to say it in different ways. And the, and the, and the Antiochians, they understand it in a different way. And then St. Dioscorus gets into the story, and so on and so forth. And then we have the church, unfortunately, splitting into the Eastern Orthodox, who are still viewed as the advocates of the two natures, and the Oriental Orthodox Church, who are still professing the one incarnate nature of God, the Word. At the end of the day, I don't want this to only be history. There's a message to be learned from this. There's a reason why St. Cyril always used to stress on the one incarnate nature of God, the Word. The one incarnate nature of God, the Word, secures my salvation. Secures that the one on the cross is not only human, he is the divine human. He is the one who is able to save the whole world. He is the one who is able to save the entire humanity through his divinity. If I distinguish him, if I say the one on the cross is half human, you know, or he's the human, Jesus, who died for us, then what was the point of the cross? You know what I mean? So there's a reason why we as Orthodox, we still adhere to the one incarnate nature of God the Word. Are there currently any communications between us and the Eastern Orthodox in this regard? Yes. And, you know, we've come around the table, uh, as we will see in later, uh, uh, in later uh, lectures today, we've come around the table to discuss uh, uh, what they meant and what we meant, and we took it from different angles. But still, there's an ongoing debate about what this all means. So this is the introduction to the Council of Chalcedon. The next talk is Council of Ephesus II, St. Dioscorus and Iftichus, and, or, or sorry, Iftichus in, 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 in Greek, but his name is Utochi, okay? St. Dioscorus, Utochi, and then the Council of Chalcedon, where the school of Alexandria is eliminated from everything, unfortunately, because it was such a prominent and effective school. Okay? I want you... To, to realize that we are literally talking about the, the masterminds who set the pace of the Christian world. The school of Alexandria was the reason why the Christian world was Christian. Because of their thought, because of their philosophy. Some people, you know, hear this stuff and think it's, you know, nice philosophical stuff. This is salvific. This, is, uh, 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 this all has to do with our redemption and our salvation. And glory be to God forever and ever. I mean, if there are any questions for this first talk,
Orthodox. And so to, to, the, to the kids today and to the people that, you know, want to marry in that church and not that church, so are we, it means we can't, like, what does it mean to us today? We can't take communion so with them? Or what's the... We are in communion with the other Orientals. Okay. The Malankara Indian Church. The Eritrean Church. Mm. The Ethiopian Church. The Armenian Church. And the Syriac, or the Antiochian Orthodox Church. And it, Shufiani, we, we had trouble with the school of Antioch all this time. But the school of Antioch, the, the Pope of Antioch himself became one with us in one family. We cannot take communion with the Greek Orthodox, with the Russian Orthodox, with the we can't with the Serbian, with the Ukrainians, Kulil family. They're a big family. They're like fourteen churches. So if somebody Messon is baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church and he wants to marry somebody in the Coptic Church. Yeah, th there's there's a form of induction that they need to go through. There's, yeah, there's a form of induction for the transfer to occur. And Masan, if I want to go take communion right now at the Syriac Orthodox Church, go. Cool. We're one with them in faith. They're going to give you communion. Uh, and it's all good. Uh, let's say uh, the Pope of Rome or the, po the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople. Let's say they attend a liturgy with Pope Tawadros. They're not going to take communion. Pope Shenouda, I think in 91, in Ambebshuya Monastery, when they were about to sign off the agreements and everything, Pope Shenouda was going to have a pan-Orthodox liturgy for all the families. But unfortunately, after they signed the agreement, they broke the agreement with us the next day. The Eastern Orthodox family. It was, uh, there were meetings beforehand, but the establishment of the protocol was, I believe, in 91 or 89, something like that. No, liturgies is a different story. يعني كل كنيسة لها الليتورجيات بتاعتها. كل كنيسة لها الأنافرة بتاعتها. You know, so, like, for example, the Syriac Church uses the Mar Adai liturgy, the liturgy of St. James of Jerusalem. Uh, Ethiopian church, the Ethiopian church, I think they have over 200 liturgies. 200 anaphoras. We used to have a lot of anaphoras, but I think Pope uh, Gabriel, Ibn Turik or something, he said three, only three liturgies. St. Cyril, St. Basil, St. Gregory. that you're talking about. There's a lot of Cyril. I think I'm missing them all up. Cyril. This is him. That's his liturgy? That's his liturgy. Oh, fabulous. Uh, and it was an initially established by St. Mark and then St. Cyril uh, modified it. Um, thank you, Mina, Dr. Mina. Right now we have a break until uh, 1 p.m. We will reconvene at 1 p.m. Um, does everybody have the form for questions? Sorry? But if someone wants to ask an anonymous question, Yanni, uh, like you can ask anything regarding theology. Uh, especially, yani, I know, especially some of the youth, we always have these like questions um, that that are very controversial. This is the time to ask how we address these things that are said to us. Yani, for example, any anything yani, uh, regarding the Kinesa Ta'atna so strict or something like this, or why don't we accept other churches or things like that. All these types of questions, feel free to ask anything. It's completely anonymous. If you need the link, we can put it on the sermon screen. Not, uh, the, not the Excel, it's the form. The form itself give you an error? Stop. Okay, I'll try. I, I will I will work it up. That's uh, working now? Yes. Yes. <laughs>
Where Bardo, if you have a question, a special question for Dr. Mina, you can talk with him now. <laughs>